it's a, a piece that um, has, I think, multiple uh, layers within his own thinking. Of course, aside from what I was referring to, this notion of uh, exploding, expanding, and, and sort of defying gravity with the, uh, the parts of the car, there's also the history of the beetle itself. Um, for Darren Ortega and for many people in Mexico, so I'll just say watch out for this piece because it, it is um, it, standing on its own. <laughs> um, the, the VW Beetle, for those of you who have visited Mexico, it is the, the car that one sees most commonly on the streets. It's used by most families as a, a, a cheap and affordable vehicle. It's also used as a taxi within the city. Um, one sees it everywhere on the streets and it, it was the, the car that really transformed the capacity of the society to uh, be able to afford um, an automobile. Uh, it was the, the first affordable car that was available. And so almost everybody uh, in Mexico has a relationship to the car, either through their own ownership or through relatives or through the use of them in, in taxis and so forth. So it's a, a sort of icon in a sense. Of course, the history of the car in Germany is very specific. It was the car that was, in fact, built um, as part of the, uh, the Third Reich. It was the car that was going to uh, be part of um, in fact, Nazi Germany's sort of transformation of society through the modernization of the uh, autobahn and also the, the car, this was the car that would be the car of the people. Um, and the VW factory was a very central part of uh, uh, sort of Hitler's industrial revolution in, in Germany at that time. So it has a very different history in Germany to, to that of Mexico, although the same sort of ethos of providing a, an affordable car for, for mass production. Um, what happened in Mexico, of course, is that um, as the cars deteriorated, um, parts were swapped. And part of Damien's interest with this piece was to, to play with the notion that almost every beetle that one sees in the city streets in Mexico City is in fact made up of various other cars. Because as one bit's fallen off, one has sort of cannibalized another car and added pieces on. So at the end of the day, when you've got a 20-year-old beetle, in fact, what you have is probably about 40 beetles somehow encapsulated in one. So part of the, the notion with this piece was to uh, sort of think about the, the, the different relatives that might have once upon a time made up this, this uh, car itself. And he was fascinated when he went to a, a workshop to see how quickly um, the cars could be disassembled by the people who worked on them um, in garages, that uh, you know, once you uh, are familiar with the car, um, you can take it apart. I think he said in about two hours it took the, the guys to take the, the car apart into all the pieces that we see it in here. Um, this gradual dismantling of a form that in fact is very familiar to all of us. It's the Coca-Cola bottle is, is the, the sort of beginning point, the starting point for this um, uh, sort of gradual uh, deterioration. The, the title of the work, um, which is 120 Days, refers to uh, the Marquis de Sade's book, The 120 Days of Sodom. And Ger um, Damien has, is essentially playing with this, this Coca-Cola bottle, which of course throughout history has been identified with the female form, with a very sort of luscious female form, the curves of the bottle being a sort of rather sensuous thing. And so extending this idea and playing with it, he worked with the glass blowers in Italy to create these different uh, aspects of the bottle, which become extruded and collapsed swollen, um, sort of flattened. So if you walk along, rather like a, we've laid it out a little like a production line here in a, a factory, but of course, a, again, a, a factory that's gone slightly wrong where the, the Coca-Cola bottle makers have decided to invent their own uh, 